Well, thanks for asking me to this amazing place you've got. I, I'm afraid I, I feel a bit like a, an extraterrestrial who sort of wandered in from the world of ties and suits and where people still write in pen and ink and things of that kind. Uh, but, but actually, maybe that's a good place to start because I think one of the problems with this crisis is that we all thought we'd got to the end of history somehow uh, and n nobody remembered what had happened before with our economy. We'd got into some brave new world where there are no more booms and busts. And one of the themes of that book, which I've written, and I've seen a few people with them on their laps, which is a good sign, is that you can learn an awful lot from what's happened historically. If you go back to the 18th century, uh, Britain has had regular booms and busts in the housing market approximately every 18 years. It's almost like a metronome, and people always forget, and they always assume that prices will just go up forever. But they don't, they boom, they bust, they boom, they bust. And yet we had a government, a banking industry, central bankers, regulators, who just assumed history away. And if you look at the way banks perform, I mean, what's this extraordinary paroxysm that we've been through? We've been through it before, over and over and over again. Um, the best description that I've encountered of this present historic, uh, of this present credit crunch is found in the pages of John Stuart Mill, who described banking collapses in the earlier part of the 19th century, how they're caused, how they peak, and what happens afterwards, i.e. the credit crunch. Beautifully described, almost to the detail of what's happened now. So, you know, there are lessons from the past. We're not in a fundamentally different era. But if I can change my metaphors a bit, um, try to capture what I think has happened and where we are. Uh, the, the, the image I use, and some of you may have heard me use this before, but I think it's a reasonably good one, uh, that the British economy in the last two years has had a massive heart attack, in effect. I mean, you know, clearly in post-war era, we've had periods of booms and busts, we've had flu, we've had uh, excitements of various kind, but what's happened this time is a really big attack. But, and this is the positive side of it, you know, the patient has survived. The patient is in intensive care unit, still breathing, showing signs of life, thinking about what happens when they go home from hospital. But it is in hospital, it's had a very bad heart attack. And it's survived because of extraordinary modern economic medicine. I said, well, there are historical precedents, but what's been applied this time mainly due to the insights of a handful of people led by the governor of the Federal Reserve in the United States, Ben Bernanke, is a cocktail of extremely powerful economic drugs that have kept the patient going. And it's a combination of drastic cuts in interest rates, the use of what's called monetary easing, quantitative easing, the deliberate creation of credit, <laughs> Uh, vast, vast budget deficits, uh, the nationalisation or semi-nationalisation of banks, and in the case of the UK, a very hefty devaluation, 25-30%, depending whether you're talking about the euro or the dollar. Now, all those things together have had an impact, of course they have, and the patient is now showing signs of life. But there is a big question about what happens after a heart attack, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But before going on to what happens next, let me just try and break down the attack into its component parts, because it's quite a complicated economic phenomenon that we've been living through. Different things have been happening and interacting. The first thing which happened was that there was a massive asset bubble in our economy, also in the United States, in Spain, Ireland, but very much in the UK an extraordinary bubble uh, in asset prices, particularly property prices. And as I say, there are historical trends which you could have, could have seen this coming. But it, it happened, it reached its peak um, roughly two years ago, 18 months ago, and has since burst 
and I was talking this morning to the commercial property industry, uh, their industry's asset values have gone down by 35-40%. Domestic property prices haven't yet in the UK gone down anything like the extent to which they should have done. Now there is a big question about whether that's an interrupted process or whether something very funny is happening in the property market. But we've had a big asset bubble, it's burst, it's burst spectacularly in commercial property, it's also burst spectacularly in the States. Residential property prices have gone down 30-40% averaging over the States, though of course it varies. And that has fed back into the banking system and one of the reasons the banks got into trouble was because they over-invested in risky property transactions. HBOS went down because of commercial property, Bradford and Bingley because of buy-to-let, all banks because of mortgage lending. So that's the first element, the asset bubble that burst. The second element was the collapse of the banks, and it's a remarkable phenomenon. I try to describe it in the book, but I don't think any of us have quite got our heads round the fact that this extraordinarily sophisticated banking system full of very, very clever people, and extremely clever people, the brightest people of their generation, could have produced an industry that just collapsed like a pack of cards. And there is an important question as to why this happened. Why was it allowed to happen? What were the dynamics of it? I think the, and I'm, I'm simplifying a very complicated story, but I think the two key elements uh, in the failure of the banking system one was excessive complexity, complexity which outstripped the capacity of the managers, the bankers themselves, to understand the products they were dealing with, combined with extraordinary leverage. You know, the big investment banks with a gearing ratio of 50, you know, loan to equity, um, unbelievable. And this was regarded as a viable business model until it collapsed. But what essentially was going on was that within the banking industry, uh, the industry was lending you know, subprime borrowers in the United States, low-income families. Um, they thought they were doing good. And, you know, that, but that's a, a, a sort of micro story, the, the mortgage lending to those subprime lending. What was important about it wasn't that it did that lending, I mean, that happens, was that the loans were sold you got the phenomenon that was called securitization. Loans were marketed. The link between the lenders and their clients was broken because of this new kind of monetization of credit products. And they were sold, and they were sold again, and sold again, and spliced and diced and, and, in very, very complex combinations. And very, very clever people were hired in order to create these products. Uh, all, all, I don't need to go into the technicalities of it. But just as a little anecdote that illustrates it, my, my younger son was a mathematician at Cambridge four or five years ago, five, six years ago, and the, all the people at the top of the faculty were approached by bankers and said, look, you know, you want to come and work for us? Uh, 50K to start, 100K at the end of the year. You know, my son, like most of his contemporaries, knew absolutely nothing about money. I mean, a lovely guy, but managing a bank account was way beyond. But, you know, being invited to join the banking industry and produce rocket science products. And, of course, the industry lost track of the underlying assets which they, they had on their books. And there's a very powerful image which is used in a book by somebody called Gillian Tett. I don't know whether you've seen her stuff writes for the Financial Times beautifully uh, and produced, I think, probably the best book on the crisis. And she's, she says the way to think about this is it's a bit like a sausage factory. What the big banks were doing, they're in, or at least certainly through their investment banking operations, they were operating like a sausage factory which bought in meat from abattoirs all over the place, who in turn bought in meat from hundreds or thousands of farmers, and they chewed this stuff up and padded out you know, the sausage, put skins around it, made money as manufacturers, sold it into a willing consumer market, everybody likes sausages, uh, and it was a great industry and a lot of people made money out of it. Until suddenly somebody uttered the dreaded words BSE, 
and you know what happens when somebody says BSE you know where's the cow you know where are the bad cows how do we get the stuff off the shelves because nobody knew where it was you know it all mixed up and you know when the panic started to spread you know the banks no longer trusted each other because they didn't know where the bad debts were you've got a complete trust complete collapse of trust in the system and markets can't function without trust and they eventually dried up and you got to the point which the governor of the Bank of England described last week I think it was last week as 24 hours from the complete collapse of the whole banking system because banks no longer trusted each other to lend overnight it had got to that stage and that was the point at which governments had to intervene and prevent complete and total meltdown so in a very very abbreviated way that was what what happened in the banking system. Of course, there are many ramifications of it. So those are two elements, the asset bubble and the banking collapse. And the third element, which to some extent was a consequence of those two things, uh, was a classic recession. Consumers stopped spending last October, November. They turned on the 10 o'clock news. Robert Peston, you know, everybody getting into a blind panic. Um, people in this country started worrying about their consumer debts, big mortgages, and it's worth remembering that the UK household debt in relation to people's incomes is the highest in the developed world, and probably higher than at any stage in our history. And people started looking at their domestic balance sheets and panicking and stopped spending. I mean, that triggered a recession, fed through into the retail sector, Retail stretch has probably contracted by 20%. You know, Woolworths, the more visible bits of it. That fed through into the supply chains, manufacturing services, your advertisers, the lot. Spread overseas into the exporting countries, China initially, Japan, Germany, were all hit very badly because the big consuming markets, the United States particularly, to some extent ourselves, started contracting. And so it became global. So you had all these three things feeding into each other, asset market failure, banking collapse, recession, reinforcing each other. And it was a massive attack, a massive attack. We hadn't seen anything on this scale uh, since 29, the great crash of the interwar period. But unlike the crash of the interwar period, this has not, at least so far, and I think probably hasn't, proved fatal. Two big reasons for that. First of all, governments and central banks got it right, broadly. The intervention that our government, I'm not making a party point here because it's not in my interest to do it, but the government broadly got it right. The emergency intervention last October was correct. And it was what had to happen. And of course, the central banks were the driving force behind it. Unlike in the 30s, when government sat back and watched the crisis develop until it was too late. And the other thing which happened this time, and it's something you'll intuitively understand because you're part of a global industry, is that although there were a lot of nationalistic instincts around the place, broadly speaking, governments realized that they had to hang together rather than hang separately. You got a cooperative response. Uh, everybody played ball, there was some grumbling, the Germans didn't want to be dragged into big fiscal deficits, Chinese and Americans blaming each other to some extent. But at the end of the day, they got down to it and worked together. And that's been the remarkable outcome of this crisis, that you actually had governments, many of which hate each other, actually cooperating and dealing with it in a, in a collaborative way. And those two things have, to, to, I think to a large extent, saved the day. But the question is, you know, where do we go from here? What's, I'm trying to describe how we got here and what's happening, but where do we go from here, particularly in, I'll start with the UK. Uh, we've, there's been a big switch in mood in the last few months. Instead of kind of, you know, manic depression, we've now got into the, the kind of hype, hyper phase, uh, you know, recovery, green shoots, all that stuff. And it is justified to have some degree of return of confidence. But I would caution against getting carried away. There are all kind of factors that are dragging the UK economy back. Consumers, heavily over-indebted. They're going to spend many years deleveraging. 
getting their domestic balance sheets back into some sort of order. So you're not going to get big spending splurges. The monetary steroids that have been keeping the patient alive are going to be withdrawn in the next year or so. They can't just keep pumping in artificially um, injections into the monetary system because otherwise you then pile up trouble further down the line. So there's got to be an exit strategy from that and we don't know how the patient will respond. The British economic recovery depends very heavily on exports and import competing industries because they've had a big boost from the devaluation, which is why you know, the tourist industry, for example, is doing well. Some manufacturers are doing very well. But a lot of the export boost, if that's what it is, depends on the rest of the world. And it is certainly true that in many parts of the world you're, you, that this whole thing is bottoming out. Maybe, maybe in France, Germany, we're not absolutely sure, but they seem to be getting on the level. Uh, the United States, probably some sort of recovery next year. And India and China are just roaring away. So, you know, all those things together suggest that you are getting external recovery as well as internal recovery, and that may help the exports to grow. So that's the one thing that we can seize upon. The other big downer, unfortunately, is the government. Uh, the government has, to a very substantial extent, been keeping the British economy going through public spending and public capital investment. That is not going to continue. Not going to continue. The big debate in UK politics, which I'm part of, uh, is how we deal with the fact that we've now got horrendous government borrowing. I don't want to be moralistic about it. I think the government had to borrow heavily in a recession. Um, and I have a separate argument with the Tories about this, but uh, they, had to, uh, they had to do it. But we now have an enormous borrowing requirement. Let's just reflect as to why that's happened and how it's happened. Uh, British tax revenue has collapsed. The share of the British economy in the form of taxation is now about 35%. That's lower than at any time since I was a child, Harold Macmillan's day. And basically, you, you may not feel like it, but you live in a low tax economy, not achieved by design, but simply because a key element of the tax base has disappeared, which is the financial sector, and to some extent, the housing market. So you've had a collapse of tax revenue, not just because of the recession, but because structurally, some of the key elements of tax revenue have gone. So you've got a collapse of tax revenue and you've got government spending continuing to rise. You know, recession, more people unemployed, government, you know, charging in, trying to prop up the housing market, trying to prop up the car industry, all those things. So government spending continuing to rise to what? 48, 49, 50 percent of GDP. So the difference between what it's spending and what it's getting in tax is about 13, 14 percent of GDP. This is an astronomic figure by most standards, and that's now having to be borrowed in money markets. At the moment, it isn't a problem. The, the, the markets are perfectly happy to lend to the British government and the Americans who've got a similar, similar deficit. It's less structural, but the Americans have got a similar scale because absolute terms it's much bigger because America's a bigger economy. But both the two big Anglo-Saxon countries borrowing massively from financial markets. And they're happy to do it at the moment, borrowing very cheaply, 2% real. No, it's not, not a big deal. But the, the, uh, the worry is that sometime down the track, um, markets will look at the UK and say, well, you know, is this a viable model? You know, you can't just keep borrowing like this. Debt piles up, debt service grows. There is then an adjustment, there are interest rates go up. That in turn pushes up your debt servicing. It then becomes very, very serious. And that's why the political debate has now switched onto this whole issue of cuts or taxes. I mean, do it two ways. But the significance of it from what I'm saying is that Nobody believes now that the government can continue to drive the economy through spending and investment. It can't. It's going to have a negative effect. So the question then is, where, where is this growth going to come from? And I've been down the list, and apart from exports, 
it's difficult to see. So the, the outcome of that analysis would be, yeah, you know, recovery, sure, plenty of signs of returning confidence, but fairly anemic. I don't want to get into the forecasting arguments about whether it's double dip recessions or flattening out and so on, but I mean, you get the train of my argument. So that's all I really want to say about where we are and where we're going from here. I just want to finish up with flagging up some of the big, difficult, long-term issues that we've got to try and face coming out of this crisis. The first one I've sort of half touched on already, which is what kind of economic structure this country is going to have five, ten years, twenty years down the track. I mean, how is the British economy going to change? It's very clear that we became over-dependent on financial services. Not that all financial services are a bad thing, clearly they're not, and many of the things that happen in the city are very useful, but we became over-dependent on a source of revenue growth, employment tax revenue that, wasn't, that was just too unstable. I mean, we were almost in the position of Iceland, not quite as extreme but over-dependent on the banking sector. So relatively speaking, that's going to have to contract. So what's going to grow in its place? Well, you know, new forms of tradable activities, and manufacturing, not necessarily metal bashing, but industry in the widest sense, including creative industries. That's the space that's going to have to be occupied. But that raises questions about whether as a country we've got the, you know, the skills, the education to make it happen. But that's, that's where we have to start looking. Second big question is what do you do about this very big financial sector that's fouled up, you know, seriously, caused a lot of damage. And here I think, although the government was broadly right last October, they have completely taken their eyes off the ball. Uh, haven't focused, for example, on how you make sure that the banks that have been rescued make sure that capital gets out to solvent companies. A lot of companies are still going by the board because the banks have stopped lending. They've lurched from you know, ludicrously excessive lending to ultra-conservative lending, and the government, in my view, should have stepped in and smoothed it out, but they, they haven't. Complicated problem because of the role of regulation, but it's not worked. But looking beyond that, how do we make sure that the big banks are structured in such a way that they don't destabilize the British economy anymore? And let's not forget Britain is the center for the world's big banks. Three out of the five biggest banks of the world, in balance sheet terms, were British in the run-up to this crisis. Uh, RBS, which was the biggest bank in the world, went down. Barclays just survived. HSBC floated away reasonably, uh, reasonably comfortably, having been very well managed. Uh, Lloyd's, another very big bank, has gone down, was dragged down by HBOS. So we've had a very, very big banking sector, exceptionally large banking sector. And the question is how you, how you restructure it. Lots of technical arguments here, but my very simple view is that we cannot continue to have a situation where you have very, very large banks which take big risks in their international activity, which then when they overreach themselves have to be underwritten by the British taxpayer. We can't allow this situation to happen again. And that means probably we're going to have to have a dual system where you have, on the one hand, competitive banks that don't depend on taxpayer support, go out and do their own thing, hedge funds or whatever, take risks, you know, commercial, business-minded, purely private sector. They can stand or fail by their own competitive performance. And then on the other hand, you have utilities, which are run and regulated like water companies, which don't take risks, except on a kind of micro level with small business, are run very safely, provide credit to normal business customers, uh, take your deposits, and operate in a very traditional conservative way. I think that has to be that clear separation at some point in the next few years. So that's the second question. How do you sort out the financial sector? I don't think we've even begun, the government's even begun really to get to grips with that. And the third and the final point I want to make, and I'll finish on this now, I think the one major thing that's affected the world in all this is that it's changed the center of gravity. 
of the world economy in a quite radical way. Until this crisis, we, it, it became part of the conventional wisdom that China and India were you know, becoming major powers. Um, their GNP measured in purchasing power terms put them right up at the top. China, before the crisis, was the second biggest economy in the world. India, probably the fourth, if you measure it properly. And, you know, we all talked, these, talked about this, but I don't think until this crisis happened, we've quite realised how important these countries are economically. I remember only a few years ago, the uh, governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, coming back and saying on television, don't get so excited about China. It's only got an economy the size of Belgium. <laughs> you begin to realise it's taken an awful long time to haul on board what's happening in the real world. You know, these are very big countries with very big economies that make a big difference. And when they move, they move big and they suck in vast amounts of oil and commodities. China was pumping out vast quantities of cheap manufacturers. That was what was giving us the illusion of low inflation. It wasn't really low inflation because the inflation was in the property market. So these countries have been making waves for a very long time, or at least certainly for the last two decades. And what's happened now is that whereas the Western economies have stalled and stalled very badly and will probably lag behind now for several years till we get out of this mess, the Chinese and Indian economies are storming ahead. What's happened in China is extraordinary. They've applied classic uh, Keynesian method methods. They were worried about a recession. They've pumped vast amounts of money into infrastructure, trying to get their consumer spending. You know, things could go wrong there. I mean, you know, think they could have problems, political problems. But as, as it looks at present, they're going to grow very rapidly. And the gap between China and the States is going to close much more quickly than we had thought possible. And between India and the other developed countries is going to close. So the whole center of gravity is changing. Therefore, the decision-making about the world economy is changing, and these guys quite rightly insisting that they want to be at the top table deciding the way the world's run. And the significance of the meeting last week is de facto they're there, and they're now calling the shots. And that's the, that's the big strategic change that's happened and which this crisis has really, really reinforced. So thank you. I, that's all I want to say. Any questions? Cheers. I, I just wanted to wonder what you thought the, the role of the F FSA was. In the, the role of the FSA? Yeah, whether it was to blame at all or... Yeah, well, they made a terrible mess of supervising the banks. Um, you know, and they've put, I mean, they've more or less put their hands up and acknowledged that. Um, they, there is, I think there's a sort of bit of a myth that there wasn't any regulation of the banks. There was. There was some quite extensive regulation. There were regulators crawling over the banks. Uh, but they, they didn't supervise them. Slightly different. Regulation, supervision, not quite the same. The supervision of the banks was, was negligent, um, and we had the problem with Northern Rock, which they didn't see coming, although there were plenty of warnings about it. Uh, there were plenty of warnings about HBOS, and they disregarded it. So they made a complete hash of that. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the uh, FSA under Lord Turner has acknowledged their weaknesses, he's now recruiting better staff, reorientating them, learning from the past. One of my main quarrels with Mr. Osborne's approach to this is I think that now that they've learnt their lessons, the worst possible thing to do is to embark on a big bureaucratic restructuring. Uh, you don't need to put the FSA in with the Bank of England. I mean, the, the, the Governor of the Bank of England needs to have overall oversight of everything to do with risk in the system, systemic risk. But the, 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 the bread and butter operations of regulating building societies and insurance companies is an FSA matter and they should be left alone. And if um, what happens is what uh, Mr. Osborne's saying, is that, as I understand it, that, that teams of people who are now working on, for example, regulating the insurance industry will be split in two and there'll be one lot that will go off and look at systemic risk, and another lot will go off and look at consumer protection. 
and there will be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of people watching their backs and, and precisely at this time when we've really got to get on top of the financial system and start looking at it properly, we're going to have a hiatus of a year, 18 months, while everybody decides who's doing what job. It's not helpful. Um, it's on, yeah. well, you talk about sort of splitting the financial industry into two, into sort of a utility part and a part that's able to do, sort of, that takes bigger risks, has hedge funds and so on. Isn't there a risk that all the customers are going to go to the hedge fund half of the industry and then when it collapses next time it needs to be bailed out because everyone's borrowed money from it and so on or no, how do you there, there is a up? risk and what I'm suggesting is not the perfect answer the points will be made against what I said that some of the problems in the banking system were not caused by the high rollers in the so-called casinos but they were caused by you know, ordinary mortgage lending in Northern Rock that was completely berserk, uh, by fairly mundane, you know, commercial property lending by HBOS in Scotland. That's what really derailed HBOS. So some people would argue, and I think this is your point, that you can't just artificially separate banking into the high-risk bit and the low-risk bit. It's not quite as simple as that. And there is certainly a danger, the point that you make, that all these... Um, you know, unreg these regulated but free enterprise hedge funds could also go belly up and somebody might need to do something about it. I, I don't think there's a perfect answer to that. Um, but the issue was raised 10 years ago by a man called Cruikshank who produced a very a perceptive report about British banking. And he said, look, the problem here, and he war I mean, it was a, the, the first real warning that was given that there's a real problem here. The British banks are making returns on capital that are far in excess of what you would expect in a low-risk industry. Something odd about this. And it's, it, it's odd because these are, these are companies that are all underwritten by the taxpayer. So something has to happen. Either they're set free of the taxpayer and forced to compete, and go down, or we just accept that the banking industry is a state, man well, essentially state industry, and it's got to be run by and for the taxpayer at one or two levels removed. And he posed that problem. The government clearly found that too difficult to handle. They didn't want a confrontation with the bankers. They let it go. Uh, it may be that you're, you're right, and that my approach of just splitting the thing down the middle doesn't work. But if it doesn't work, then actually what we would have to argue for is much, much tighter regulation of the whole lot. Um, but I'm trying to get a middle way. Yeah. Um, I really got two questions. For this two system approach to work, wouldn't we need global agreement for, for it to happen? And I guess my, to use your analogy of the patient, isn't it inevitable as we develop better, more sophisticated drugs, the patient is going to push themselves harder, so eventually to the point of breaking? Isn't that just human, human nature, especially group human nature? Well, yes. I mean, you, you, that's a rather fatalistic conclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are people who are arguing that. They say, well, what's the point of bringing in more regulation? Because the guys will find a way around it. You know, they're clever, they're driven by, you know, greed or whatever, and you can't stop it, that's the way people are. So what's the point? You know, let it all happen again, you know. Uh, and I, I just think that's the council of despair, actually. You, we, we do have to try to make the system better while understanding there will be people out there who are constantly trying to find a way of breaking through and breaking the rules. I mean, you have this in your own industry, right? I mean, you're, you're an innovative industry, moving very fast, You've got regulators who are trying to catch up with you, <laughs> and it's very much the same in banking. The problem is I don't think you can destroy the world economy. Maybe you can, but in the way that the bankers have been able to, or almost. So we have to try, though you're absolutely right that in a, particularly in a free enterprise system, there are limits to what regulation can do to restrain seriously damaging behavior. Right. Um, so you said we were 24 hours away from 
the banking system going into complete global meltdown. And well, that's um, how it looked in the UK. Yeah. yeah. So I just wondered what what could have actually happened and how bad things could have actually got and what meltdown actually means. Well, I don't want to be too flesh creeping. I mean, I, um, I, I think I think the way the governor of the bank described it, you know, that kind of the ATN system would probably just have stopped working for a while. Um, and it, you know, banks would have just ceased to function um, for a while. But in that kind of environment, governments just step in and do it. Um, so I, I, the idea that we would have returned to some kind of Stone Age is, I mean, it would never have happened. Uh, but it would have, you know, if it had been allowed to continue, it would have been really horrific. Um, and of course, other banks would have collapsed, not just IBS. You know, some of the others that were near the edge would have gone over too. Where, where there's um, very low interest rates and the government's pumped a lot of money into the system. What's your view on the risk that this will create another bout of like serious inflation and like a second, like fairly serious dip? The, the question, I don't know whether it was heard at the back, was about whether there is a danger of a return to inflation. I think the professional assessment at the moment is that the risks of that happening are very low. That there is a greater risk um, at the moment of lurching back into deflation, in other words, falling prices. The one scenario that has horrified the central bankers and governments too is that we do get into a world of falling prices, falling output, falling wages. You know, we've seen that in past episodes in history. We have been on the edge of that. I think it's actually true at the moment that prices are falling. I haven't seen the latest indicators, depending, it depends which measure you use. And that is a very dangerous world because if, you, if prices start to fall seriously and systematically, then the real value of people's debt and companies' debt, of course, grows. And that increases the extent to which you're trapped in, in a, in, in a you know, debt deflation, as it's called. And governments and central banks have been desperate to make sure that doesn't happen. There is a risk of overreacting. There is a risk of that happening. Uh, there's very little sign of it happening. And I think the central banks, including our own Bank of England, are acutely conscious uh, that you know, this is a latent problem, and if it started to become apparent, they would react quickly with interest rate increases. I mean, so I think the sequence of events has been properly thought through. That there is a bigger danger in the longer run than the one you described. It isn't that there's an accidental spillover into inflation, but that governments take the view that they've got such problems managing public debt that it would be easier to let inflation rip, to, to, to wipe it out. Because this is what's happened in the past. The, the, the British government debt after the Second World War in relation to our economy was far, far bigger than it is today. Far bigger. It was after the First World War. It was in the, much of the 19th century. And these things were dealt with through inflation. Governments let inflation wipe out past debt. And I think some people worry that this is a big temptation in future. Uh, the one restraint on that temptation is that the Bank of England is now independent. It has an inflation target. And I can't see any government publicly saying to the Bank of England, we want you guys to run higher inflation. Don't see it. Politically, I don't, it couldn't happen, I don't think. With, with Mr. Osborne's star waning and, uh, and broad cross-party support and, and, uh, and, and respect for your insight, uh, do you think there's a good chance that you accept the offer to be the inevitable next Conservative Parliament's Chancellor? No, no. It, it, it does, <laughs> the system doesn't work like that. We, we, <laughs> We, 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 it's not like football, you know, where you, you, you have an agent and you go off from Man U to Man, Man City. It's not like that. I mean, we, we, we have parties, we work as parties. Uh, quite, you know, we, we are loyal to our teams, actually. I mean, there is real loyalty and commitment, and we're elected as Lib Dems or Conservatives, and we, we stick with our people, unless you have a, 
civil war as happened in the Labour Party in the early 80s. But, you know, we stick with our people. So it's not a question of my going off and doing something. It's a question about what the combination of parties is after the next election and what comes out of that. But that's not for us to decide. I mean, the, the public decide that. Can you guys hear? Okay. So I have a, a few friends who are in the uh, working for the brokerage places, and they're whenever I chat with them, they're saying, yeah, it's pretty much back to business as usual. They're doing the expensive lunches and having a lot of fun. Is it possible that the country tries to ignore this and, and kind of reset to the way it was? Like, it can, could that even happen? Is it, or has so much damage been done that it's actually impossible? I didn't quite hear all of it, but were you just saying that there's a potential danger of a return to the same behavior that caused the problem? Was that the question? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think there is, and you know, and I, I meet an awful lot of people in the financial community, and it's a year ago, but you know, a year ago is a century ago. You know, <laughs> that life's getting back to normal, and why shouldn't they get back to normal? And uh, you know, there were people who warned, uh, philosophically and practically, about the dangers of a bank rescue, that it's a so-called problem of moral hazard. Um, the, there was a 19th century philosopher called Herbert Spencer who was a follower of Darwin and he produced what I thought was the most uh, pungent definition of moral hazard. He said if, you, if, if, fo if, if fools are allowed to, to profit from their folly, we populate the world with fools. And that in a way <laughs> could happen in the financial system. People who've been rescued say okay, fine. Right, that's good. If we get into trouble again, we'll be rescued again. Well, you know, let's push, push things to the edge. And there is a real, real danger of that happening. That's why the government has to be much more aggressive, I think, on the bonus culture and so on that it has been. Because it's so very easy to slide back into bad habits, knowing that someone else is eventually going to pick up the pieces for you. What is going on in the UK domestic property? Sorry, I can't. Sorry, what, what is going on at the moment in the UK domestic property market? Uh, you're talking about commercial or residential? Residential. I, I don't know. It's a, strange, it's a strange phenomenon what's happening in residential property. There was a lot of analysis done uh, before the, the crash, uh, the IMF and others, who suggested that on any reasonable assessment of fundamentals, fundamentals being supply and demand and the relationship of price to people's incomes because that's what determines what you can borrow. Um, the British domestic property market was probably 30% overvalued, probably. And we know from previous episodes in history that when you get a market correction, it goes more than that before it stabilizes. So th th there is a question, why hasn't that happened? It, it has happened in a few parts of the country. You've had a really big crash in some of the East Midlands cities, uh, in the middle of Manchester, uh, middle of Leeds, where you've got these big blocks of flats, which you know, the developers can't sell, and that's driven down the price. Uh, but it, it, it hasn't happened in London, um, except in little pockets. Now, there are two theories about it. One is that we just, it's just a, a matter of time that this correction will happen. Uh, that at the moment the market is being artificially sustained by the fact that you know, property is being withheld and so that, you know, there isn't the supply and this is artificially creating uh, stable prices in the short run. That's one view. Uh, the other view is that you know, something fundamental has changed. You know, makeup of families, migration have created a supply and demand at a different level. Uh, I, I'm not a forecaster, and I'm let alone a forecaster in property markets. My hunch is that it's the former rather than the latter, but I'm, I'm certainly not in the business of giving you financial advice as to <laughs> when to buy and sell houses. Can you? Yeah. Um, to your point earlier about um, the, your Herbert Spencer quote, and also your first conclusion um, about the new industries that are going to have to take the place of the financial service industry, 
Do you think there's anything the government can do to incentivise the new brightest and best from the next generation to not go into financial services? Because you can see already that they're still being incentivised by the bonus culture and the top tier are being taken into those banks still. Is there anything the government can do to drive them into the new industries that we need? Well, we'd, we'd, I'm not sure the government can directly do very much. I mean, we don't have labour conscription and I wouldn't advocate it. Um, I think to some extent there is, a, there is an element of fashion. You know, there was a whole generation who felt that the, the really smart thing to do, if you've got a good first, you know, is to go to work for Goldman Sachs or Lehman's. You know, it was, it was the intellectual cream and you could make pots of money. Uh, so, you know, that, it, but, but I think that wave has probably gone. I suspect those people probably now want to come and work for you. <laughs> I don't know, but I suspect they might. Um, probably what needs to happen, I'm not sure how you make this happen, because you can't, can't force labour markets, is that one of our big problems is that lots of kids, you know, who've got real mathematical ability, for example, uh, would do physics, engineering, you know, what, what's the incentive for them to do it? You know, they're going into fairly low paid jobs, uh, very, you know, relatively little upside, and somehow or other we need to change the psychology so that that becomes a really attractive thing for people to do. Um, I mean, as it happens, my younger son, who I mentioned, um, didn't succumb to the temptation to go into the banks. He realised his dad's MP's salary could probably keep him going for a few years, so he did, did his PhD physics research, and he's now doing theoretical physics. But it's not very well rewarded, and it's a very insecure world because universities are being cut. So somehow or other, we've got to try and create an environment where the really, you know, the really trendy thing to do is not to work for an investment bank, to, but to become a physicist or an engineer or a chemist or the kind of things you do. Um, but you know, you're in a position to give incentives. What would you say to the argument that a lot of the problems we're experiencing now stem from a decision that the US government made all those years ago to basically delink its currency from the gold standard. Um, and do, would you see this, a reversal of this decision as, as perhaps a, a panacea for the problems that we're experiencing now? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's that, you know, that's a bygone world. You know, we, you know we, we've lifted exchange controls, capital can move around. It isn't, it isn't easy to sustain currency pegs any longer. Uh, the, um, you know, the traumas in 1992, you know, was it Black, Black, Black Monday? Um, once a, a, a country tries to hold an exchange rate against speculative trends, it, you know, it's, it's bound to lose because it's a one-way bet. So I think we have to accept that the major currency areas, which will be the US dollar area, the Chinese area, whatever we now call that, uh, the euro area, you know, these are going to float against each other and it's not possible to fix them in practice. Um, but I think what your question does touch on is that there, one of the underlying sources of instability is the big imbalances between what happened in the United States and China, the very odd situation really, where you had a poor country essentially a poor country, saving more than it could invest at home, exporting it, exporting their savings to a rich country that was living beyond its means. And I'm not trying to make moral judgments on either side, it was just a fact of life. And vast quantities of Chinese savings flowed into the United States and helped to finance its government and private deficits. And that worked great for a while, you know, it kept the world economy growing over the last decade or so, but it was doomed to come to an end, and it is in the process of coming to an end because of the crisis that's been caused by the flood of Chinese liquidity into Western economies. And if you read behind what's been said at the G20 meeting, it, a lot of it, a lot of the debate is about how you achieve that rebalancing in an orderly way. Uh, how do you make sure that Chinese savings goes into Chinese development? And that's linked to the issue of their exchange rate. 
how does the United States adjust to be a better balanced economy? But I think simply going back, to, we can't talk about really going back to the pre-1971 world. That's, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, over here. Uh, you mentioned previously that you essentially agreed with um, the rescue package that the government put forward um, to get us out of this crisis. Um, and I saw yesterday that Alistair Darling is now talking about bringing in uh, a law or regulation to limit the amount of debt in one year the government can go up to. Is that not in some no, way I tying the hands of the government in the future? No, I, think that's, I don't think that's sensible. Uh, no, let me clear what I said. I, th I think in the emergency last autumn, I think the government did the right thing in terms of recapitalizing banks, providing the guarantees, being willing to step in, semi-nationalize, the drastic cuts in interest rates by the Bank of England. I mean, all those, that package was the right thing to do in an emergency, and it prevented a very bad situation getting even worse. I think since then, I think they've let a lot of things drift, and one of the things that's been allowed to drift is the lack of attention to the flow of credit into the business sector, keeping business going. I think they've not paid enough attention to that. Uh, and arguably not addressing sufficiently up front the looming issue of the public sector deficit. So I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing the fact that we have a large deficit because the conditions have arisen that made it inevitable, but there has to be a very clear plan to get rid of it. Now the particular proposal that came up yesterday, let's have a legal target. Well, what does that mean? You know, if Alistair Darling misses it, does he go to prison? You know, I, it's, 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 it's a political process. It's not a legal problem. It's not a legal problem, and, it, and you know, he, he's, he wants to go down the legal route. George Osborne wants to set up a quango to deal with this. You can't deal with this in that way. It's got to be dealt with up front. We've got a big deficit. The politicians have got to spell out very clearly what this means in terms of public spending choices and taxation. It is a purely political matter. And we've got to level with you about what the options are, and then you've got to vote on it. But hiding behind new laws and quangos does not deal with the problem. Um, I actually did a physics degree at university, and two years ago I made the choice between um, doing a PhD or coming here, and I sold out to come here. Um, well, a company that, brought, that was brought by here. Um, I, and I wondered what you think we can actually do to stop people like me taking these jobs and, and actually... <laughs> well, I don't want to make you feel guilty. I don't know what you do. I, 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 I definitely yeah. remember saying I'm selling out, and I did sell out. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, so I guess my point is, I know, that, I know there's been efforts made in the past, I know there's less and less people doing physics and maths, there's departments closing around the country. What can we really do to stop this? I, th I think as far as the deterioration in British science and mathematics is concerned, I think the penny has dropped. I had a debate in Parliament about four years ago, because I picked up, I was personally interested in it, because my constituency houses the National Physical Laboratory and the laboratory of the government chemists. You know, I have lots of physicists and chemists who will live in my area. Um, so I, but I think the government realized you know, four years ago, three, four years ago, there's a really big emerging crisis because very large numbers of kids are coming through the system without basic mathematical literacy. Not enough further maths. Most of the further maths and physics is taught in private schools. You know, the state system is just not delivering. And I think they have now focused on that in terms of helping recruit more properly qualified teachers who can do specialism, not generalities. And it is beginning to make a difference, but it's a slow, it's like turning around an oil tanker, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Well, it is hard, yeah, you know, making brains work is hard, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Vince Cable. Thank you. Thank you.